the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <coughs> Baptism of the Lord Sunday always seems to come abruptly, doesn't it? For us, yes. We celebrated Christmas less than a month ago. And maybe some of us haven't fully gotten around to taking down all our Christmas decorations. Last week, Jesus was a toddler, receiving the gifts from the Magi who had traveled such a long distance, following the route provided by their OnStar navigation system. And then today, all of a sudden, Jesus is an adult, standing in line to be baptized by John in the Jordan River. This is a great reminder that this story is not a chronological, biographical account of the life and ministry of Jesus, but it's an inspired story, with a capital S, that points to something greater at work in the world, a God who is ever and always showing up and coming along beside us, just in time. The baptism of Jesus is one of the few stories that all four gospel writers share, indicating how important this story was for the early church. And though the specific details of the story vary with each gospel presentation, the writers all begin their understanding of Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us, with Jesus entering the waters of baptism. Mark's is the gospel that doesn't waste time on providing details which would otherwise make for a very good story. His account of Jesus' baptism is just eight verses, compared with the longest in Luke's gospel, with 22. For Mark, words are not to be wasted, which means there is space for us to read and listen between the lines for what good news might sound like. When I read the gospel with a listening ear, I hear the wind howling through the wilderness. I hear the steady rush of river water. I hear nature as untamed and wild as in the beginning, when it was all watery deeps that were murky and formless, being stirred up by the wind of God. This is a sweeping down the mountains, snapping off treetops, rearranging the cosmos kind of wind. This is a wind that troubles waters, foreshadowing Sam Cooke's prophetic anthem that it's been a long time coming, but a change is going to come. Do you know there are risks to getting into water like that? This is no tranquil tide pool. You shouldn't wade into it alone. So perhaps the good news is we have Brother John already in the water to extend to each of us his hand to hold on to as he says to us, come and be baptized and proclaim by your actions your break with the powers of empire 
and your commitment to the God who knows how to lead people through troubled waters on the way out from bondage to freedom, who guided sojourners through the wilderness, and who provided sweet water from the rocks in parched times so they could keep on keeping on to the promised land. Come and be baptized as the sign of your repentance from following the tendencies of the world to valorize the ones with wealth and status, those who are convinced that the key to power is to rule with the fist of fear rather than the open hand of love. Come and be baptized, and let these waters wash away the labels put upon you by a society beguiled by nationalism, imperialism, and exceptionalism. And in their place, receive a new identity, a new self-understanding, a new community, a beloved community, as Brother Martin Luther King Jr. described it. Friends, we need a hand to hold on to with that kind of invitation pulling us into the water. And those like John, like Jesus, like Martin, like Ella and Fannie Lou and Rosa, who all point to the troubling of the baptismal waters signal to the rest of us still standing on the riverside that God is doing a new thing. But it's not a brand new thing. The Spirit has always been hovering over the waters of formless voids and struggles in life, ready to stir up again people who are not afraid of getting drenched along the journey of faith. When Jesus steps into the waters of the Jordan with the Spirit descending from above, he steps down into the chaos of life and trusts the power of God to keep on creating meaning out of that chaos, even through him, and even through us. It's fair to say that when we remember our baptism, we're not remembering the act of being baptized so much as the naming that occurred, the name that is our deeper identity of being beloved to God. Today, we remember and shout out loud if we have to, like Martin Luther, I am baptized, when facing the voices of despair, cynicism, and fear that would prevent us from accepting this truth. Remembering your baptism means getting into deep water, where you can't always see the bottom, and the current pulls you in a new direction. Standing before these stirred up waters you can't just dip your big toe in. You must take a deep breath to be plunged under and raised up in order to hear, you are my darling child, my dearest one. In you, I am well pleased. These words may have come from heaven, but they did not come out of the blue. They echoed God's words from Isaiah long before. Do not fear, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are precious in my sight and honored. And I love you. God remembers us, Isaiah says. In fact, I imagine God cradling us in the palms of love's hands, tenderly holding us when we feel like bruised reeds and shielding the dimly burning wick that is our energy and our hope until it can burn steadily once again. In baptism, it's as if God is saying to each one of us, no matter what happens, and no matter how low and discouraged you may feel, no matter what is happening to you and in your life, never let anyone tell you you are anything but a precious and beloved child of God. How might your life change if you understood that even as you struggle and have hard times, you are always beloved to God because you are you and God is proud of you? How might our understanding of church change if we thought of ourselves like that? Imagine, 
hmm. what God could do with us and through us. There is so much power in claiming our belovedness. For once we claim it, nothing in this world can take it away. Remember that Jesus took the plunge right along with us and doesn't send us anywhere that he hasn't gone first. So in this season of Epiphany, the season for surprising revelations and sparks of new life, believe the good news that Jesus comes into our world with all its beauty and terror and routine, making tracks to the water's edge where the Spirit's hovering and God's naming await us. Don't be afraid. Take a deep breath and dive in. Amen.